I want to first thank uh, Stephen and Emily and the Asbury staff and all of the Asbury family that has welcomed me and my family into the Rochester community. Um, Pat, my husband, and I and our children are so thrilled to be in Rochester. And we're very excited to embark on this journey of ministry together with Asbury First. I realize that this is a holiday weekend, so if you are here today, or tuning in, rather, um, you are very intentionally choosing to be tuning in, to taking some time out of your celebration to be in worship. While Americans around the country are celebrating Independence Day, we're together in spirit as one body, celebrating our own kind of independence, freedom in Christ. The spirit of Independence Day is freedom. It's a foundational value of our nation, of our communities, and of our Christian faith. Around the nation, people are reading the Declaration of Independence, and they're reciting these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. In my Christian heart, this statement rings true. God creates us all with a grace that triumphs over all of our divisions and calls us to treat our neighbors as equals. We celebrate this day that marks an historic claim of independence from injustice and oppression. But we're not naive. If we've spent any time at all learning our history, if we have spent any time at all paying attention to the world around us, we hold this celebration with tension. We have so far to go until we are all free. Signers of the Declaration of Independence celebrated their freedom from injustice while they themselves held people in slavery. Since 1776 and even today, Americans continue to ask the question, who is free? The tragic truth is that it might be easier to answer the question, who is not yet free? Although just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Juneteenth as a national holiday for the first time, we held that celebration with tension. We have so far to go until we are all free. After slavery was ended, Jim, Cl Jim Crow laws resurrected the injustice. And after Jim Crow laws ended, the war on drugs and mass incarceration resurrected the injustice. And still, we have so far to go until we are all free. And traumatic, horrific violence is regularly committed against women and children and Asian Americans and trans and non-binary folk, not to mention the simple but devastating everyday sexism and racism that binds us and imprisons us. We have so far to go until we are all free. So who is free? In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all are the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. We are baptized into one body in Christ, no longer slaves or free, at least not in the way that we might have thought of freedom before. Christ erases the dichotomy of slave and free, erases ethnic separations, but wait. Before we start thinking that that means that those things don't matter to Jesus, listen, that is not what I am saying. Paul writes that we become one body in Christ, which means if someone isn't free from injustice, none of us are free. 
Christ erases the dichotomies, the separations between free and oppressed, male and female, upper middle class suburbanites, and homeless addicts. We arrive at freedom together or not at all. And Paul states that Christ doesn't want us to leave anybody out. In Christ, we're in this together. Paul writes, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Think about your own body for a moment. If you have a part of your body that's a little sore, a little achy, maybe you've injured it before or it's even been replaced, it might bother you more than other parts of your body. Or if you have ever had a cancer or an ongoing illness, you will hear Paul's message loud and clear. Many people, when they are injured or ill, have their attention drawn to the area of pain and discomfort, and they'll tend to it. If the head hurts, they'll rest it. If a bone is broken, they protect it. This is a way to facilitate health and healing in the body, and we only stretch and push to build back strength when the time is right. Yet other people will muscle through. Have you ever done this? If the head hurts, they will power through. If the bone is broken, they will wait to get it checked out. We fancy ourselves Carrie Strug, thinking that we have to flip ourselves over the vault in order to win a gold with a sprained ankle. But we aren't, and we don't have to. And we find that our injury or illness or trauma or stress sneaks through the rest of our body, impacting all aspects of our life until we finally pay attention. When one part of the body is hurting, whether we are aware of it or not, the rest of the body hurts with it. And as it heals, the rest of the body wakes up again to rejoice in the healing. In his letter from Birmingham Jail, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. writes to white Alabama clergymen who called his actions extremist and who told black and brown people to just be patient and wait for their freedom. Now King writes as a member of the church and as a member of Christ's body, the church, he proclaims that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He writes, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. King invokes the name and spirit of St. Paul in his own prison epistle from Birmingham jail as he names clearly that the whole body of Christ is impacted by the injustices against one part and that to muscle through as though nothing is wrong denies the God-given liberty and freedom to the whole body. Just as an illness denied healing will grow or spread until it forces reckoning, King writes that oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The late James Hal Cohn, Cohn, author of God of the Oppressed and Black Liberation Theology, taught me theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Dr. Cohn was a brilliant theologian and a joyful, though strict, teacher. Through his influence on my theological education, I came to understand this truth. There is no real theology of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is not a theology of liberation. God is a God of the oppressed, and, God, and Christ comes to reconcile us all through the priority of those who are not yet free from injustice.
Paul writes as much as he describes the body of Christ. We are inextricably connected. No one is free until we are all free. When we declare independence, we mean for all people. Now, church, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me, you know, pastor, that sounds like a great idea, but it's just not doable. If I had a nickel for every time somebody told me, you know, if poverty could be solved, we would have solved it by now. If I had a nickel for every time somebody tried to explain to me how they can comfortably live without the burden of poverty or racism or sexism on their life, well, we could redistribute the money and feed the whole city of Rochester. Martin Luther King Jr. writes, Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through on the tireless efforts of men, and I'm going to add women, willing to be co-workers with God. And without this whole hard work, time becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. Declaring independence is not enough. We must declare interdependence. We who claim to live in Christ know that our freedom to be the people that God created us to be is through unity, through community, only as part of the greater whole, the body of Christ, can we be truly free to be who we were made to be. Otherwise, we stagnate. We're stuck in like kind of a shadow life. We feel imprisoned and frustrated by ourselves, resentful of others. We might even be looking for freedom from it, a way to escape a mundane and meaningless existence. But this shadow life, this half-life, can be left behind for true life in Christ at any time, as long as we're willing to let it go. And this is where we declare our independence from injustice. Wherever we find ourselves complicit with a system of injustice, we're actually discovering our shadow selves. If our lives intentionally or unintentionally do harm to others, we're living a shadow life. We cannot live fully in the body of Christ until all can live fully in the body of Christ. I found myself asking over the years the same question that King himself asks. Is organized religion too inextricably bound to the status quo to save the nation and the world? Not if we declare interdependence. I think that sometimes we conflate the independence from injustice that Paul and King and even our founding fathers wrote about with an idea of freedom that seems to think that our actions are of no consequence to others. Too often the idea of freedom means that we can just do whatever we want, whenever we want to, and that what we think and what we say and what we do and how we spend our money doesn't and shouldn't matter to anybody else. We want to do what we think is best for ourselves without having to consider the greater good. But followers of Christ know we can't do what is best for one person without doing what's best for all people. We are inextricably connected. Followers of Christ know that freedom in Christ is not free. It comes at a great cost. That shadow self, which can, excuse me, it requires sacrifice. Through Christ, we let go of the old self, that shadow self, which can be an uncomfortable or even painful process to lose what we have always known. And we are baptized into a new life, declaring our interdependence with the body of Christ. 
Church, we did not arrive here alone. I did not arrive here today to be where I am, alone. We do not have what we have only by our own actions. The profound Pauline statement, we do not make nor save ourselves, rings true. Our freedom comes through interdependence with Christ. Friends, I feel that today is a very special day for myself and for my family and for Asbury First. The Discipleship Project is a vision born from my own and my husband Pat's commitment to the gospel and living the gospel. And it's inspired by the early Methodist movement, which was an incredible movement that swept across the country, making new disciples. We have found that throughout our whole life, throughout our faith journeys, the most foundational Christian formation experience for us have been in small groups, practicing actual active discipleship. We believe that we can learn how to be disciples by being disciples. We believe that we grow and change through our commitment and accountability to a small group of fellow disciples. And in these groups, we are all students and we're all teachers. Rather than reading a textbook by an expert, we read the texts of our own lives. Here's the thing that's tricky. Discipleship inevitably changes you. Discipleship definitely, very much, changes your life. To be fair, it changes us from freeing us from our former shadow selves and opens us up into abundant and eternal life in Christ. But not everybody wants to be changed. Not every faith community is at a place where they're open to being changed by Christ from the inside out. Not every faith community wants to work tirelessly as co-workers with God for freedom from injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So many people are really totally okay with stagnation and the status quo. But as very first has proven that our answer to King's question, are we too inextricably bound to the status quo to save the nation and the world, is a clear and resounding no. We declare independence from injustice. We declare interdependence. And we will arrive at freedom together or not at all. Thanks be to God. Amen.